Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the people of Acorn Christian Church. And I pray that you would continue to help us to grow in you, help us to get nearer to you and just begin to reflect you more and more. Father, protect us in our travels, our vacations, our families, our health, our understanding, and God, lead us in our evangelism. We love you so much, God, for your word that you left us. It's been such a great way to impact this planet the way you did it. We just, uh, my respect towards you, God, and your planning and the way you've put things in order is just perfect. Your timing is so good. We ask you to continue to move amidst us this morning through the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would cast down the imaginations of our sinful minds, our earthly minds, and help us to tap into the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this morning we're going to talk a little bit about discipleship. You know, sometimes when you haven't been around church a very long time, you just, you hear the word disciple and you immediately think of the twelve. And after you've been around a little bit and you start to read the scriptures, you realize that Jesus didn't just call these 12 people disciples, but everybody Jesus reached out to, he called them to be a disciple. And so it might be important to know what a disciple is if we're being called to be one. Uh, and uh, that word disciple, I don't know, in English, the closest thing we might have to it is discipline. And that might be an aspect of discipleship, but I'm not sure that that's the whole uh, definition of discipleship. So here on the board, we, we've got a, a dictionary type definition. It says the condition or situation of being a disciple, a follower, OK, a follower, a student or an imitator of someone or something. A student, an imitator of someone or something. And also another word that comes to my mind is an apprentice. When we think of the word apprentice, it gives us a little bit more of a flavor of how discipleship is kind of more than just knowing about someone. It's, it's kind of participating in their world or taking on their trade. When you think of a, a woodshop apprentice or an artist or a musician apprentice, you start to think, well, that's someone who imitates. He's a student of somebody teaching him, but it's somebody who kind of takes on his character and his traits and, and begins to be a reflection of their teacher. So there's a little bit more involved. In the resurrection, there's a very famous verse that many of us have heard. Jesus came and he said all authority in heaven and earth had been given to him. And now he was taking those 12 that he had worked so long with, the 12 apostles, the disciples. And he said, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it's interesting, as, as people dabble with Christianity, a lot of times they feel like Christianity is simply the knowledge of who Jesus was, or simply the belief in the Bible, or simply helping someone to understand the gospel. But when we really listen to what Jesus asked us to do, it wasn't nearly to impart knowledge. It was to create disciples. It was to help find people who were willing to apprentice under the great teacher, Jesus Christ, and become like him. And that when you found those people that were worthy or willing or wanting to become apprentices or disciples or students or imitators of Jesus, that at some point you would help them to come to the water to be baptized. Because wrapped up in baptism, is the death, the burial, and Jesus, uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, the Bible says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism, so that just as Christ rose from the dead, we too may rise with a newness of spirit. And we've been studying that in our uh, conversion series that we completed 
the seven part series that we've done for seven weeks. But now we're going to kind of twist a little bit and start thinking about what discipleship is. This verse I have highlighted here in the bottom with the Greek on top of it is a famous verse by Paul. And he says, I want you to be imitators of me, uh, be become in imitators of me as I also am of Christ. And it's interesting, and I know you don't read Greek, but it looks kind of like English. And this is like an M in Greek, mimetai, mimetai, mimetai. What does that sound like in English? Mimic. mimic. Okay. So when we use the word English mimic, we usually don't use it with a positive thought. A matter of fact, you might say, well, don't mimic me. Don't, don't tease me. Interestingly, in the New Testament, this word mimetai, which really does mean to mimic or to imitate, is always used in a positive light, never used in a negative light. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And here uh, I want to ask another question. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. And he says, Paul says, be imitators of me as I also am an imitator of Christ. Was that arrogant of Paul to say, imitate me? How do you feel about that? I mean, really, if, if Arthur tromped up here and he said, I want you all to imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Would that jab you wrong? Would you feel a little bit like imitate you? W what do you mean? And so we, we need to learn about this because Paul was so bold to offer that as a way of journey for your apprenticeship, for your discipleship of Christ that you would imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. And I would dare say that wasn't bold or arrogant, but that there's something that we need to capture in that. So I want to point out another verse as we get rolling, and that's from Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And basically the tail end of that verse says that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So this is significant because they had never been called Christians before. And this verse in Acts 11:26, this is 10 years after Jesus has died and risen from the dead. And so one question we might ask, if Christians weren't called Christians, what were they called? When people followed Jesus and they walked with Jesus and they believed in Jesus's message and they adhered to Jesus's message, who were they? What was their identity? What, what title did they have? What, how did we categorize them? What name were they? I mean, they were Jews. The predominant uh, people that followed Jesus in the beginning were all Jews. But, but these were different Jews. These were Jews that believed that the Messiah had come. These were Jews that believed that the scriptures had been fulfilled. These were Jews that had received the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father. They weren't just ordinary people. And so in some verses you might find that Paul is in testimony. He says, I am one of those who are of the sect of the Nazarenes. Because Jesus was from Nazareth. Or others would grab hold of the idea in another passage where they were the people of the way. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But Christianity, in its, in its form as we might know it today, hadn't morphed yet. The movement of the truth was ahead of its reputation. It was ahead of its label. You know, movements in life and revivals, a lot of times, if not all the time, they don't get their label first. When God is stirring and moving and a great multitude of people are changing and things are happening, it's not until that movement has gotten a full foothold that it's gotten momentum and that it's begun to uh, get the awareness of the rest of the world that the world wants to put a label on it. And so it, it, it's at this point, about 10 years in, as Christianity is beginning to explode and create congregations in many, many different cities that it hits the city in Antioch, 
a Gentile city, and their church explodes full of this faith and, and this transition of, of humanity and people are beginning to come to Christ that aren't Jews. They're just regular folk. They're from outside in the world somewhere. They didn't have a background in any form of true religion. They, they, they just came from the world into Christ and this church is born and they begin to be discipled in how to follow Jesus and the world wants to give them a label. And so they call them Christians because in Greek that makes sense. It means they're Christ followers. The, and Christ means Messiah. It means anointed one. These people are Jesus followers. And so the, the world gave these disciples of Christ a name. So I want to ask a question. Did Jesus call you to be a Christian? Or did Jesus call you to be a disciple? Or is there a difference? Should there be a difference? You know, I think it's so easy to be called a Christian. Because the world would say, they're not, they're not really wrapped up whether you're a Christ follower or not. They just want your identity. Are you a Christian? You might think, well, I was born one. My mom raised me in such and such church. I'm a Christian. And it's all like this proclamation of, of knowledge. I'm a Christian. It's our tradition. I'm a, I'm a Christian. It, it's our tradition. Or, or my mom was a Christian. My grandma was a Christian. Therefore, I'm a Christian. And so Christian can lose its oomph <laughs> if it doesn't have its basis in the reality of the Bible. Because what Jesus called us to was to be his disciples. And that has more meaning. Because a disciple is a follower, it's a mimicker, it's an imitator, it's a doer, it's a believer. And it shows its belief by what it does. And so a true disciple hears what Jesus says and tries to implement that as a practice in his life. A Christian might simply be defined as a believer. And as has been pointed out by some, the scriptures tell us even the demons believe. But they don't do. They don't imitate. So thoughts. Am I crucifying the name Christian? Absolutely not. I just want you to understand that every disciple, yes, is a Christian, but not everybody who claims to be a Christian is a disciple. And what's more important, to have the title or to have the life? It's more important to have the life. And we want to be disciples of Christ first and foremost. And if the world wants to call us Christian, amen. In that century, as time evolved in Rome, what that meant was crime. It was a crime to be a Christian. We, it, it, we study the history further, we find out as that Disciples of Christ exploded and began to create congregations all throughout the Roman world. At some point, Rome said, you know what? It's time for the Christians to get out of Italy. They need to get out of Rome. They need to get out of this area because Christians are up, uh, uprooting our kingdom. Their, their, their doctrines and their teachings are beginning to put fissures and cracks into our structure of government. And so they push the Christians out. And we know that that's where Aquila and Priscilla came and Apollos and, and many of the other churches. And God uses the persecution of the Christian church for the purpose of evangelism. Because sometimes we're not keyed in enough to hear that the Holy Spirit wants us to minister in different places to different people. That he needs to add persecution and a little prodding, a little fire to our life so that we'll step out and do what he wanted us to do anyway. So I want to talk a little bit about this picture. Who, who is this? <laughs> the Mona Lisa. How, how do we all know that? I mean, this is one of the most famous paintings in the uh, history of, of uh, humanity, probably. This painting is probably known across the world more than probably any other painting, they say. So has anyone ever seen it? Roberta's seen it. Chris has seen it. Did you go with her on that trip, JB? 
She's hot without you. <laughs> Anybody else seen it? Where, oh, Richard's seen it. Where is the Mona Lisa? Not on the picture. I want, uh, where is it physically today? You haven't seen it. I, if you all went to see it, you must have went somewhere. Where'd you go? I saw one, one at, while it was at the Smithsonian. Oh, you saw it on tour. Okay. In the Louvre in Paris. The Louvre in Paris. Chris, did you go to the Louvre in Paris? No. Where did you see it? Well, I was trying to figure it out. I see it because it's been in the painting. I don't know if it was in New York or Smithsonian. Maybe on the move. Or, oh, yeah, because even with King Tut's exhibit, remember they, they would take that on tour? Or, or the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sometimes they take these magnificent artifacts of history on tour so that if you can't come to see them, you, you, it, it might come to see you. I can remember waiting in my mom, with my mom in line when I was about nine years old and we were in LA and we waited for hours in this line that wrapped around the blocks there in the heat in, the, in, in LA County and it was to see King Tut's, uh, that mass, that famous one that we think of when, when we see it. And uh, boy, I, I, I remember everything about it. It, it. it impacted my life. So all you scholars out there, I'm going to put Roberta and, and, and Richard and, and Chris on the spot. Sorry, I mean, I, <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> Which one is the original? Who, who, Richard? Which one's the original? Left. Okay. Left. We got two lefts. You better go with them, or else you're gonna <laughs> get isolated. Hmm. So it's interesting. They look pretty well alike, right? And if we were to study history, we would find out that, that these other ones popped up and, and they weren't sure because they are so similar. Matter of fact, these two are the same painting. This one was what happened after this one got cleaned. So after this one got cleaned, it became that one. Okay. So there's all actually two paintings being displayed here on the wall. I did that to trick you a little bit. The other one, they call it the twin. And at first they thought it was a forgery. But the more they researched Leonardo da Vinci's life, they found out that he painted two. And that uh, they began to question, you know, is, is, is this by Leonardo is it, or is it by one of his two students? Because he had two students, uh, apprentices, disciples, if you will, Salai and, and Melsi. And these two guys lived with Leonardo and studied under him for years and years and years. They learned his strokes and his techniques. In the beginning, Leonardo wouldn't let them paint. He only told them, all you can do is draw. I want you to understand how to draw before you paint. Okay? And when they got to the point where they, they understood the, the fiber within them and how to draw and how to depict and how to see a body. And, and by the way, Leonardo di dissected more bodies than anybody in his day so that he could understand where the tendons and the muscles and all that stuff were. He was, he was very into knowing the form of the body and how it functioned. And so he and his students would do this stuff and he would train them and eventually he would let them paint. And so when the museum curators finally found the twin Mona Lisa, they thought for sure this must be uh, from one of the students. This must be a disciple of, of Leonardo because, because it's so close. It's so similar to the piece. A matter of fact, if you really stare at them, you'll see that this one's kind of a depiction of the Mona Lisa from standing here. But this one over here, which is one, is, is as if you were standing right next to him on the easel next. And it's just a slight, slight curve of that picture, because they had a real model. As if you were just a little bit more, maybe 15 degrees doing that. And they wrestled and they argued about this for years and years. And technology has grown, and here we are 500 years later, and we have the powers of x-ray and carbon dating and test the paints to see and we found out the paint was the same the canvas was from the same sheet we through x-ray saw the drawings underneath and they were similar and we found out that some of the strokes of paint were probably from the same brush because 
There's no, it's like a gun, you know, when they do the forensics testing and the bullet goes out the gun and it has all the etching and they can determine, did, did this bullet come from that gun? Well, we can use that same kind of science with a brush. And they're like, you know, there are brush strokes on here that, that are on here. And so confusion has set in and debate. Did Leonardo paint them both? Did Leonardo not paint either of them? Did his disciples work with these paintings? And Leonardo stood over their shoulder and kind of did a few brush strokes on them to complete them. Did, was it a corporate work? Did they work together? And we don't know. Because the work of the disciple became like the work of his teacher. And this is what Jesus wants from us. Jesus wants us to be disciples. He wants us to reflect him. At the end of the day, he wants it to be so strong that people have to debate. Was that the Holy Spirit that did that? Or was that Pam just being creative in her thought processes that day? Was it God that moved Vern to say that? Or did that just come out of Vern's compassion or Vern's character? And God wants us to melt ourselves with Christ so much that the world just ends up saying it's another Christian. It's a Christ follower. It's an imitator. This is the power of imitation. You know, the world kind of gives imitation a bad rep. Uh, and we're going to get to that more. But first, I want you to look at this picture. And all of us that have been dads or moms, we've seen our kids put our shoes on and walk in our shoes. And it's kind of fun. You know, I've watched all my kids do it. And of course, the kids are fascinated because daddy's shoes are monstrous to them. And they put their little feet in there and, and they have to kind of curl their toe up just to hold on to the two when they're walking. And they don't lift the shoe all the way up because the foot will fall right out. But they just kind of drag the shoe across and they do this kind of thing with the shoes. And, and it's cute. I would think it happens so often. And, and kids just have this natural affection, this natural desire to imitate their, their parents or to imitate those who are their heroes, you know? And, and it, it's, it's, it, it's in us. It's built in us to imitate. But we're in a world that kind of exalts authenticity. We're in a world that always says, it, it, you're a copycat. What do you, oh, well that's dumb. How about doing something unique? How about, how about being uh, authentic? In a world that exalts authenticity, where men are always trying to establish a unique identity, Jesus calls us to imitate God. And that, in, and that in and of itself is so unique that only Jesus has ever done it perfectly. So Jesus gets on the planet and he calls us to imitate God. But that has never been done. He does it perfectly. And we're going to see that in some verses. But that idea of imitation is today unique. Because there's such a resistance to imitating. In the world, we want unique. We want a unique movie. We want a unique book. We want a unique piece of poetry. We want a unique painting. We want everything to be unique. In our efforts to be unique, we're not unique. In our efforts to be individualistic, we're not individual. But the one who steps off this conveyor belt and says, you know what? I'm going to imitate Jesus. That actually becomes unique. In John 5, 19, Jesus said, Verily I truly tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. 
Jesus basically says, when I see God doing, that's what I do. I can't do anything independent of him. What I see the Father do, I do. I'm a reflection of him. I'm a perfect representation of him. I only speak what he asked me to speak. I only do what he asked me to do. I'm in complete obedience to the Father. Perfect imitation. In Hebrews 1.3, the Bible says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's essence. He is the perfect reflection of God's character. Jesus is the perfect reflection of God's character. When we think about God and, and, and his character, we can say Jesus is the list of things. When we think about love, we can say Jesus demonstrated love like no other. When we think about joy, we can say Jesus was the demonstration of what the joy set before him was. When we think about patience and, 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 and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, we can look at Jesus and therefore we can learn the character of God through Jesus because he came as a man so that we could finally relate to God. God had long ago said to the people of Israel, Be holy, for I am holy. It's not like all of a sudden God came up with a new plan. I want you to be like me. In the beginning, he said he created man in his image. From the very beginning, he created you to be in his image. But Jesus was given to us so that we could flesh it out a little bit. He became flesh so that we could understand what imitation meant and we could understand God's character in a new way. But who are we imitating? So in Hebrews, it's interesting, this verse, it says, so that you may not become sluggish. And I put all these different words there because your translations may have different words in this point. So that you may not become sluggish, so that you may not become dull, so that you may not become lazy or slothful, but imitators of them that through faith and endurance inherit the promises. So we're in the midst of his discussion and he's talking about men that have gone before us, holy men, men of faith, men that have walked with God and, and tasted the heavenly gift of, the, of, of God's spirit moving in them and accomplishing things that give life and men that lived out faith. He says, I want you to imitate them because God's, God's trying to help us to learn discipleship. Discipleship's not merely belief. And discipleship's not merely being a student. You know what? If, if I was going in for surgery and, and uh, let's say it was heart surgery, God forbid, please, Lord, don't let this be prophecy. <laughs> and I had the option of getting my heart surgery done by a straight A student who actually went above and beyond in all his works in college and learned things that probably no other heart surgeon had ever learned to date. He was well-schooled, but never, ever, ever, ever had yet practiced heart surgery. And then I had another doctor who had practiced heart surgery maybe a hundred times. Well, you know, I've done this a lot of times. And probably in the midst of a hundred times had two malpractices. Because that's, that's life. Most doctors don't list their malpractices on their resume. I mean, it's not something you talk about. But if you're a doctor or if you've walked in the uh, hospitals close enough, you know that every doctor eventually is going to have a malpractice. The public doesn't really know that, but every doctor somewhere, they're not perfect. Guess who I'm going to take? Am I going to take the student who's never done surgery but knows everything about it? Or am I going to take the guy who's 98% of the time successful? 98%. Even though he's not as educated, he has put his education into practice. That's the difference between a student and a disciple. 
You can be a student of Jesus till you know the Bible frontwards and backwards and you can quote it and argue with people and you can do it. You can quote all the doctrines of the Bible and the scriptures of the Bible. and You could just have the whole thing memorized. But I don't want to imitate you until you've learned how to put it into practice. That's a disciple. And so we need to learn to be disciples. I want us to grow in our knowledge of Christ. I want us to grow in our scriptural accomplishments. I want us to have the knowledge of the word. I want us to know how to use it. I want to know how to pray it. I want to know how to walk it. I want to know how to swallow it, to chew it, to decipher it, to unpack it. I want to know how to live it. Okay? But I don't want to leave it up here. It's got to flesh out. And when it fleshes out, that's when you are truly a disciple. In the next verse I have there, it says, and, and this is why we can imitate people, by the way. I, I, that's why I put it in there. We, that's why we can choose to imitate people in our process of learning how to be like Jesus. We can find Christ in people and we can see how they're living out aspects of Christ. And we can say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus the way J Josiah is in his evangelism. Because Josiah is bold and he doesn't leave himself anyone on the chart of I'll leave it to somebody else or I don't think I know enough to deal with that person. He doesn't leave anybody on the conveyor belt. He, he says, the Lord put this person in my path. That's who I'm going to evangelize like. like. I want to be like Josiah. Because I think in that part of his life, he's captured what Jesus was like more than I have. There are other people, their prayer life is really great. And I know it. I've discovered it. Not that they paraded it on the corner, but I found it. I found evidence of it. I say, Lord, I want a prayer life like theirs. Because that's a prayer life like Jesus's. So you bet you can imitate people. Imitating people doesn't mean that you have to imitate their unchristlike behaviors. But it means you find Christ in them and you imitate those good behaviors. And that's discipleship. 1 John 2 6 says, Whoever claims to abide in God, that means to remain in God, to be in God, to be saved, to be born again, to be one of those real Christians, whoever claims to be a disciple, should be walking in the same way Jesus walked. That's a reflection. That's a measuring device. Jesus wanted disciples. Not just believers. All heaven believes in Jesus. Guess what? Everyone in hell believes in Jesus. In the end, when we step off this planet, everybody's a believer in Jesus. Jesus doesn't simply want believers. He wants disciples. Are you a believer? Are you also a disciple? And it's not too late. If you're not, you're like, you know what? I, I'm a Sunday Christian. I clock in. I listen to you for two hours. I go home. I'm glad when you're done early. <laughs> well, then you're not a disciple. Not because you don't listen to me, but because Christianity is not wrapped up in two hours on a Sunday. Yeah. Following Jesus is a life. Every day. No, I don't know about the students of Leonardo, whether that Leonardo was so controlling that he was like, okay, guys, not only do you have to paint like me, but you got to eat like me. You got to have a proper diet like me. You got to live like me. You got to dissect these cadavers like me. You got to do everything like me. If you're going to live with me and be my student, then you got to imitate everything I do. I don't know if he did that. But I think for Christ, we're not talking about Leonardo. We're not talking about an artist. We're not talking about a wood shop. We're not talking about an apprentice shop to an amazing job. We're talking about eternity and a God who created you in his image. Yeah. So it's all the more important. Input creates output. And you can't read it all, and that's okay. I, I, I stole the slide, and, and I knew it was cluttery. But the concept is that what we put into our heart is what we get out, okay? And so, and, and, and there's categories of this. 
What are you putting into your heart? The world? If you think that two hours of Bible study or Christian worship combats the other seven days of the week, or six and a half, that you put the world in, then you're, you're tricking yourself. You, what you put into this heart is what comes out on the other end. And so if all you put into your heart is just a very small amount of Jesus' word, and then the rest of the time you put in the world's movies, you put in the world's uh, activities, you put in the world's books, you put in uh, fellowship with dark people that have coarse jesting, you put in your workplace, which may be a difficult environment, and, and, and you put on all these, these things into your heart. And then one day when you are put on the spot and, and somebody cuts you off in, in the road and out of your mouth come a bunch of expletives, it's because that's what lurks there. That's what you fed there. These, these words you come up with that are dark or, or, or curses when you're angry at somebody, they didn't just, boom, come out of nowhere. Output comes from input. And what you put into your heart is what you're going to get out of your heart. What do you, and, and so how do things get in our heart? Well, what we see gets into our heart. What are your eyes looking at? And, and, and how do you train your eyes? If you spend your hours looking at pornography, if you're usually men are the problems with this, you, 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 and I admit women, there are some like that, uh, I'm not discrediting, but, but men, if you spend all your hours looking at pornography, or any of it, what input becomes output. Pornography produces adultery. Pornography produces lust. Pornography devalues the opposite sex. Pornography is sin. Input produces output. Guard your eyes. If all you do is roll around in the neighborhoods and you look at the nicest houses and you dream about the front porch and the three stories and, and how beautiful this would be and I wish I could live there and you, you, your whole life is spilt with covetousness. Maybe it's cars, maybe it's houses, maybe it's swimming pools, maybe it's this or that or it's items, it's physical materials and all you do is soak it up all the time dreaming of wish you hads. I'm not saying all of a sudden that's going to produce it. It might. You might get that house. But what I'm saying is that you've put all your vision into worldly, terrestrial, earthly things. And your eyes are not on Jesus. You can't expect to reflect Jesus. Jesus didn't think about houses. Jesus didn't think about what car. Oh, man, that's a great model donkey you all pulled off there for me to ride in for my triumphal entry. I'm the king. Ooh, 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 ooh. I'm riding on a donkey. That wasn't Jesus' mindset. Some of us are so earthly mindset, we can't produce Jesus because our eyes are not looking at the right place. Turn your eyes to find Jesus. Can you find Jesus in your workplace? You bet you can. Even amongst a bunch of crazy workers that are not following Jesus, can you find Jesus? Yes, you can. You can look at all the same things from a different angle and find Jesus. So how do we, what else creates input in our heart? What you do. What you do by repetition puts a pathway into your soul, into your heart, into your mind, and it creates output. So if all you do is watch television or all you do is spend time on the internet, it's going to affect your output. If all you do is work in the garden, and that's your whole thing, it's going to affect your output. Not always negatively. Not all these things are completely negative. The garden, I, I, I remember great times with God in the garden. Great times. Thinking about the parables of the pulling the weeds and how you got to be careful if I pull those weeds, I might uproot the plant and how delicate you got to be and, 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 and the harvest and all these things. So right there in the midst of what you do is the possibility for it to go in dark or to go in light. But it has to do with your attitude. What you hear. Do you imagine that if you're in an environment where all you hear all the time is worldly talk and evil, that you're not going to one day produce evil? 
But we just don't think this way. If we were making a cake, what you throw into the cake is what's going to come out on the other end. You can't throw strange ingredients into the cake making mix and expect those strange ingredients not to have an effect on the cake. So why do you think life's any different? Life is your great cake. And what you put into it is affecting what you get out of it. What you touch, what you touch is going to affect how you touch. Your quality time, how do you spend your quality time? That's going to affect your output. Let me ask you this for a side note, and I won't camp here, don't worry. Does your bank statement, if someone was just to download your bank statement for the month <laughs> and interpret it, would they come to the conclusion that you're a Christian? Why not? Why can't your bank statement be a reflection that you're a Christian? That some of the things you purchase weren't for yourself. They were for others. You can go down the list and, huh, Tommy bought flowers. He doesn't like flowers. Huh, Tommy bought $120 worth of lunch? He doesn't eat that much. Huh. It doesn't always have to have a check written to some church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking more. More than that. It's a lifestyle. Matthew 15, 18 through 19. Jesus says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth, the output, come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, lying, blasphemy, slander, all that stuff, that yucky stuff comes from the heart first. Every action originates in the training realm of your soul. Everything you do happened here first. When you say it and it's wrong, it happened here first. When you do it and it's wrong, you did it here first. Yeah. And that's why correcting the outward of behavior can become worthless. That's why Jesus says you've got to wash the inside before you go about washing the outside. You can get the outside of that car looking really nice and get in there and find out the guy left a banana in there. And it's nasty smelling. When a, you ever had one of those baked bananas in your car that you didn't realize was in the lunch bag in the back? Or how about the hard-boiled egg you forgot about? That outside of the car can look really good, and it can stink and rot on the inside. Jesus said this is our spiritual life. All these outward things that you do, all these laws that we've created about what's right and wrong, they originate here. And so this is where the battle is. This is why it's important. If we're going to be disciples, if we're going to be followers of Christ, we've got to change this. And when we change this, it changes the output. Matter of fact, we don't even have to focus on the output if we get the ingredients in here right. Our motives begin to be right, and the output begins to be right. James says it this way. He says in James 1, 14 and 15, But every man is tempted... When he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed, then after lust conceives, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So, so he says, first you have the lust. And here, lust is not about sex necessarily. It can be. It's about desire. In here, you have the desire. You are Lusting, you're enticed, you're gripped with temptation about something, and you're wrestling with it in here. And he says, when this thing conceives, when it gives birth, that's when you sin. That's when it comes out. And if you let that thing keep going, that's when you die. Spiritually and eventually physically. In Luke chapter 6, 39 and 40, Jesus, speaking a parable to them, says, Can a blind person lead a blind person? 
And, and he wants the answer no here. I, you know, I know some of us are analytical. We're like, well, it depends if he's experienced with this blind stick or if he's one of those guys that's trained with got ears for it or something like that. No, <laughs> Jesus is trying to make a point. Don't follow something that's not the right example. If we're going to be like Jesus, follow the example of Christ. When Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, we are going to imitate those who reflect Christ. The very next verse, Jesus says, the disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone that is fully trained shall be like his teacher. He says, Jesus is saying, when you're a real disciple, you become like your teacher. And when you're fully trained, it'll be like that Mona Lisa. We might not be able to figure out which one was painted by the artist. Can we manipulate the output? Yeah, when we manipulate the input. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is acting like something you're not. The Greek word originally has to do with the theater mask. They would put masks on, and so they were actors. And that was, the, the, the early word had to do with the play and, and the theater and the arts, and they would put on this mask. And, and then the audience loved it. They were like, wow, this is amazing. I really understood who he was trying to be, and he had that mask, and it just gave me an uh, understanding of who he was trying to depict. And as time evolved, that word hip, hypocr hi hypocrite, uh, in Greek it, it almost sounds exactly the same, that word became a symbol of somebody who puts on a mask. They want to look like a disciple. They want to look like a Christian. They want to look like they follow Jesus. But the inside has not transformed. They're acting. And it's not the acting of mimicking. It's not the acting of imitation. That's good. If I think, well, what would Josiah do in this situation? I'm at the grocery store, and there's this guy, and I already feel like, well, I should probably invite him. How would Josiah approach that? Hey, dude, I like your orange shirt. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, 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 maybe we better catch the character of what Josiah is doing and not exactly how he does it. But if I haven't changed inside and then I try to do the acts, the amazing part is Richard leans against the wall and the light goes out. <laughs> no. The, uh, the acts, how often we, even without kind of knowing I think from a very young age, somehow, God puts in this hypocrite meter, which is like fake, fake meter. You're like, this is not sincere. This is not the real deal. Unfortunately, salesmen some half time have to do this, huh, JB? We got to put on the fake meter. <laughs> this is going to be the best car. This is going to be the last car you ever want right here. You know? Part of, part of sales, you know, and, and, and that sometimes makes a difference between a good salesman and a bad one. Because people will get their fake meter on. And they'll go, this guy's just trying to sell me the car. And so he'll tell me anything. This guy over here, he actually pinpointed some of the things that's wrong with the car and may not go with me. He actually spells it out. Oh, this car has this, this, and this, which you seem to want, but it doesn't have this. This one has those other items, but it doesn't have that. And he, he doses it truthfully. I'm grabbing, uh, me, my fake meter, I'm gravitating toward that guy. Yeah. This guy might be selling 10 cars faster than this guy, but I'm still gravitating toward that guy. I'm not talking about cars. I'm talking about Jesus. And how are you going to imitate him? How are you going to Make yourself an apprentice of Jesus. How are you going to come under his tutelage? How are you going to let him be your teacher, your master, your guide, the apprentice maker? How are you going to find worthy people to imitate? 
you're going to have to have some purposeful and strategic imitation. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 17, it said, Paul's writing, I do not write these things to shame you. He gets all done with, with kind of spelling it out to them. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through this gospel. Therefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. Same Greek word we started with in the beginning. Be followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which are in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So I want to break this down, and this is our last verse. So Paul is talking to the church in Corinth. He's talking to the disciples of Jesus in the church in Corinth. He's talking to these Christians. And he acknowledges to them that you have 10,000 instructors in Christ. That means there are many things in life that will teach you about Christ. Everywhere you look, the Bible in Romans chapter 1, it says, even that which is created, the divine creation, teaches us the elements of God's power, of his influence and his glory. That even in creation itself, when you go out and see the stillness of a lake or the church, of a bird or the blowing of the breeze through the wind. You, you, can, you can discern attributes of God and His beauty because all of creation reflects our wonderful God. And the desire of our wonderful God is that the very main thing He put His focus on above all the trees, the grass, the water, and the field, and all the inanimate things and even things that have life, the thing that He treasures the most, the thing that He imparted His image and His character in, and the thing that He wanted the most to reflect Him is you. And Paul acknowledges all through life you have instructors. Sometimes an instructor is an experience. Wow. Hate the car illustrations today, but when I put the high test into the car, it sure does seem to run better when I don't put this junky gas I got off the corner store. So sometimes the lessons and instructors about Jesus have to do with experiences you had or, or, or decisions or accidents. And that's instructors. Those, those are it. But Paul says you haven't had many fathers. What is Paul saying? I was there with you in the beginning. God used me as an instrument to transition you. I was one of the, you know, Paul was the one who went to Corinth first and brought the gospel. We learned last week, if you're really listening, that Paul brought the gospel to Corinth and Apollos walked in and watered it. Paul brought the seed, God, uh, Apollos watered it, and God brought the increase. And so Paul's appealing to that seedling that you had in the beginning. He's saying, I was the instrument that God used to really bring the radical transition of your life that led you to becoming born again. I was that initial one. So I need you to hear me. That's what he's saying. He's stripping it down for him. I, I need you to hear me. You've got all these instructors in life, all these influences, but I need you to hear me. Is that arrogant of Paul? Is that wrong of Paul? Therefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. For this cause, I sent you Timothy. Well, wait a second. Wait, you sent Timothy. Why did you send Timothy? Because he's my beloved son. Was he really Paul's son? No. His son in the faith? Yes. And faithful in the Lord. Timothy is my son in the faith, and he's faithful. And he will bring you into remembrance of my ways. Timothy has learned how to be like me. And I have learned how to be like Jesus. If you look at the ways of Timothy you will see a lot of my ways because Timothy is a good disciple. And so strategic or purposeful imitation, strategic discipleship is the concept of finding people that you can mentor under, finding people that you can receive from, that you can be taught by, that can be examples. Are they perfect? No. no. 
Are they Jesus in walking flesh? No. no. Can you find Christ in them? Yes. yes. Okay. And so we need these people in our life. And I'm afraid some of us don't, we're not used to that. I don't follow anyone but Jesus. I'm only following Jesus, and I'm going to figure out Jesus from the good book, and I don't need you to help me. Was that like Jesus? Was that the demonstration? Is that what he asked you to do? So we need one another. To be part of the same body, we need to be discipled by one another. We need to be mentored by one another. We need to listen to one another. We need to hear one another. And I realize that sometimes we hurt one another. And sometimes you're like, you know, I ain't listening to that guy. There was this one time 15 years ago, and you won't believe what he said, and it insulted me, and I'm not going to hear a word out of his mouth since. That's ridiculous. Because you're hurting yourself. If God has continued the journey of maturing that person and helping them grow, and you're saying they have nothing to offer me because they injured me once. I follow G Jesus in Josiah in my illustration in one aspect. There are other aspects of Josiah I don't plan to follow, son. I love you, but I don't follow you in the, some of those aspects. But I still love him. Find Christ in one another and be mentored by one another. Timothy was a good reflection of Paul. Follow Timothy, he's telling them in Corinth, as they would follow him because you were learning Christ from me. That's discipleship. That's apprenticeship. We're going to end there. But I want to end with the thought process here on the next slide about this, what I've kind of opened the end, is strategic discipleship. And I'm going to open it with a question. If you had the world's most important message... And you needed to get it out to everybody. It's the world's most important message, and you needed to get it out to everybody. And you have at all your dispenses any means possible to get it out. As a matter of fact, you've got a time traveling machine. You can go back in time, you can go forward in time, you can get this message out in any method you want to. How would you do it? The world needs this message. It's desperate for this message. How would you do it? Would you use Facebook? Or how about the printing press? Make sure everybody has a copy. Television? <clears throat> All across the world. High power radio? Helicopters jumping pamphlets? Conferences? Stadiums? Just think about it. God has a message, and he wants to get it out to everybody. He had all of time at his disposal. He had every methodology. He could have chosen for Jesus to come in our information age so that the gospel would be blared on the airways. He could have made it a mass infusion of knowledge. But instead... He sent them in the first century to a manger to be born as a baby, to grow up, and to teach the principle of discipleship. In the end, Jesus chose discipleship to be the message carrier for salvation for the entire world. We would probably choose a lot of different ways to get the message out. Jesus chose discipleship. So, how important do you think Jesus thinks discipleship is? Absolutely. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Please unpack it for us. Help us to grow as disciples. Help us desire to mimic you, to impersonate you, to grow like you, not to be hypocrites, but to transform from the inside out. Father, we love you. We're eager to see more souls come to you. In Jesus' name, amen.